Postcards from a Dying World, the podcast. For more than a decade, I've reviewed over 1,000 books that are mostly science fiction, horror, and bizarro. This feed will feature bonus audio I have produced over the years, as well as a monthly digest of reviews based on what I've read each month, plus the occasional bonus material about my own fiction. Thanks for listening. Okay, joining me on Postcards from a Dying World is the Indiana Jones of Kung Fu movies in North America. He braved uh, go walking past heroin addicts and explaining Dirty Ho at, to border guards in Canada to make sure that the movies that deserve to end up in a museum got in a museum. And that is his film collection, one of the largest, I believe, of um, canister uh, Kung Fu movie collections uh, in North America, I believe. I could be wrong about that. But uh, Dan Halstead of the Hollywood Theater in Portland, Oregon. Dan, welcome to the podcast. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. Yeah, and um, I benefited from your collection when I lived in Portland because you do an ongoing series of, of Kung Fu movie uh, screenings that I went to, and I believe... I saw some prints of yours too at the um, Thanksgiving Day marathons, um, but we'll get into that later. But I want to talk about your origin story with kung fu movies and um, and a little bit of my own too and how I got into it because I think it's really important for young people who have access to every movie they could ever want to see on YouTube. <laughs> you know what it was like to try and track down or discover these movies. So how did you discover Kung Fu movies? Well, I grew up um, actually not really having access to anything. I grew up in a super tiny town, uh, 605 people in the middle of nowhere uh, in Oregon. Um, so the town didn't even have a movie theater. Uh, luckily it had a video store, but I don't even think there were any Kung Fu movies there except maybe Enter the Dragon would be. Right. Um, so I grew up not knowing about those movies. I was always obsessed with movies. Like going to that video store, there were limited classics. There were a lot of horror movies. I watched a lot of 80s stuff, like all the classic 70s, 80s horror stuff and tons of more obscure slashers. Like amazingly, those showed up in small town video stores, but not Kung Fu movies. But I had a weird obsession for them already like I remember reading movie books and even just seeing movie posters and I would read about the movies and I'd be obsessed with them like Master of the Flying Guillotine I remember reading about that movie and just being obsessed you know as a kid like what is this movie what actually happens in this movie you know and then when I finally saw it it's even greater than you could even imagine but um so I didn't really see them growing up um except for for the basics, right? I saw some Bruce Lee movies and I saw some Jet Li stuff. Um, but then as soon as I graduated high school, I got the hell out of there. Um, and I moved to Portland. I've lived in Portland my whole adult life. Um, and when I first moved, I was, what, 18. I started working as a projectionist right away. Um, and once I found out there was a job where you just handle film and watch movies and read and you don't have to deal with the public. I was like, I'm gonna do this for the rest of my life. Like this is what I'm doing. Right. Um, but I became more ambitious since then. But projection's always been part of my life and that's how film has always been part of me. But um, I discovered uh, the video store Movie Madness when I first moved to Portland and I would rent everything. I finally had access to all the movies I'd read about and you know, I'd rent all the classics you're supposed to watch and I'd rent the European art films. And I'd just walk out with a stack of VHS tapes every time I was there, like every other day. But I would also rent Kung Fu movies too. Um, and I just quickly found that I liked those movies just as much, if not more than all the films that you're supposed to love. I thought these movies are just as good, if not better, they're cooler. So Movie Madness didn't have a huge collection of Kung Fu movies at that point, um, and it was all VHS. And so I basically went through everything they had and watched most of them twice. Um, but then I worked as a projectionist at this one screen movie theater, a really rundown theater. Um, it was the Roseway Theater since you lived in Portland. Mm -hmm. At the time, it was a really terrible place. And next door to it was an Asian video store. 
And so I would go in, work at the movie theater. I'd be the only person who worked there. I'd sell your ticket. I'd sell you your concessions. I'd run the projector. There was a baseball bat under the concession stand. <laughs> if anybody like got out of line. And um, when the movie was running, I would lock the door and go over to the video store next door. <laughs> you know, there'd only be a couple of people there watching the movie. And I would go rent stuff and I'd peruse that. And so I discovered a lot of stuff. Like that's when Movie Madness had Shaw Brothers movies, but you know, a lot of that stuff was still hard to find back then. That was in the mid nineties. Um, and so, you know, that store, I don't even remember the name of it, but that's where I discovered so many Shaw Brothers classics and Golden Harvest stuff and Lee Sound Nam independent films and so mm -hmm. many movies. Well, so that was really how it started for me. Yeah, and for me, I, I got into Kung Fu movies when I was a little kid in the 80s and how I discovered them was, in, I grew up in Indiana and in Indiana we had, um, on, we had a local channel, Channel 4, that was the independent station. It's now since been eaten up by CBS. But um, at the time, Channel 4 had, they had a cowboy host who did Western movies on Saturday afternoons. But on Friday nights at 11.30, they had a horror host named Sammy Terry. And for, for my friends and I growing up, Sammy Terry was everything um, because he would show horror movies at 11.30. But right after Sammy Terry was Black Belt Theater. And- Every Friday night? Every Friday night at 1.30 wow. in the morning. And yeah. so how I discovered Black Belt Theater was that um, I would, turn on our Betamax to record Sammy Terry in case I fell asleep. And one time I was watching whatever hammer horror movie they had shown on Sammy Terry and the heroic ones, uh, the Shaw Brothers movie came on one time and it was my first time seeing English dubbing and seeing people doing like trampoline jumps and wire foo. And um, it's the Shang Shay classic, the heroic ones. Yeah, that's and, great. Yeah, and which has epic battles. And I remember thinking, what on earth is this? It's insane. But I didn't totally get into it at that point. But there was, at the time, kids were going crazy about something that was happening on HBO. And that was the premiere of Sho Kasugi's Revenge of the Ninja was a big deal because then once everyone saw Revenge of the Ninja, everyone wanted to see more ninjas, <laughs> right? Yep. Totally. And, and at the time, I, my, I was so into ninjas and I don't remember if it was my mom or my dad somehow noticed that on the TV schedule that on Black Belt Theater, they were showing a movie that was called Chinese Super Ninjas. Oh, wow. Yeah. yeah. So my next experience was well I just turned on Sammy Terry and recorded all the way through and I had a double feature that to this day was a huge inspiration for my first novel Hunting the Moon Tribe which was this VHS video that had a double feature of Dracula Has Risen from the Grave Christopher Lee and Chinese Super Ninjas from the wow. theater <laughs> right which was a pretty cool way to be introduced to this that's great and, yeah yeah, and so that's how that's kind of my origin story is because once I saw Chinese Super Ninjas, I was like, all right, I'm recording Black Belt Theater every week. So I had a huge collection when I was growing up. It was actually still Betamax. That's why I didn't like hold on to them forever because they were Betamax. But I, for a long time, I had all these Shaw Brothers and Hammer movie double features. And one thing that Black Belt Theater on Channel 4 was the one that didn't have a host. They didn't have a host. They just, they would have all these funny sound effects and then and come across the screen and say Black Belt Theater. It was great. <laughs> and so, <laughs> so that was my origin story on this. Because then after that, like I wanted to, to, to find these things. Um, do, you do you have any memory of like one of the first like movies that you rented that really like turned the tide for you? as like, holy shit, this is the movie. Because for me, it's definitely uh, Five Element Ninjas, AKA Chinese Super Ninjas. Yeah, well, you can't beat that movie. That movie's incredible. If you don't like that movie, just get, you're not gonna like Kung Fu movies. Like, give it up. Right. That movie is so much fun. Um, mine were, that was one of the first ones, but 
I remember Executioners from Shaolin, the right. Lao Kar Lung movie, um, with Pai Mei as the villain, Lo Lei. Um, that one really hooked me right away. Um, and Master of the Flying Guillotine. And what else did I originally? Oh, of course, 36 Chamber of Shaolin, mm. which at the time it was Master Killer on the VHS tape was the title. And that one just completely blew my mind when I watched it. And I just thought, how is this movie not taken as seriously as, you know, Seven Samurai? I was like, this is just as good. It's incredible. You know, and not even just like, oh, it's a super fun movie. Like maybe like, you know, Chinese super ninjas, I can see where some people are like, oh, maybe it's, they would call it campy, you know, and it's just fun or whatever. I think it rules. I think that movie also is on par with those other movies. But, you know, 36 Chamber is a, it's a more serious film, right? Mm -hmm. So those are the ones that really hooked me. Um, Sonny Chiba's Street Fighter was another one I saw on VHS. Um, so yeah, then the list goes on from there. <laughs> Yeah, for me, definitely as a kid, that the, the ninja craze that got started by HBO, yeah, um, and the canon films like ninja movies, which are terrible and don't age well, but I still love them because they're part of, you know, the yeah. origin story of how I got to where I am. <laughs> and um, I'll shut up pretty soon and let you take the floor, but I do want to say that I had an experience when um, when I moved to San Diego. Um, I moved here in 2002 that um, when you talked about the Asian store, it reminded me because um, around probably the thickest phase for me for Kung Fu movies was um, in the wake of the release of Crushing Tiger and the first like a couple years after that, because that's when I was researching and getting ready to write my own Wuxia novel, Hunting the Moon Tribe. So I was very steeped in all of it. And Coming from Indiana, when we moved out here from Indiana, in Indiana, I had to, I had to really search down the DVDs and really look hard for them, and and it, there wasn't a lot of them, right? And so when I moved to San Diego, it was funny because I I didn't have a source for them, and then randomly I went into this um, Asian market, uh, this very like hole in the wall, dirty Asian market called Hing Long that's still there. And uh, by the way, I was in there one time and the Wang Fei Hung theme came on the Muzak. <laughs> and I'll ne never forget how I was like, whoa. But at the time I was in Hing Long and I, I was like, hey, where do you, I asked the people like, you know, where do you rent movies? You know, where, and they were like, didn't understand me. They didn't speak a word of English. And I was just like, okay. Um, and then I walked out of the store like dejected, like, ah, I'm not, not going to figure this out. And I look and there's a video store literally next to the market. <laughs> and I went in there and I was like, my eyes got wide because they had everything. And they had like, they had shell and soccer, which hadn't been released in the US yet. And they had, they had all these movies. And so I just went nuts. And over the next, like, this was the first like month or two I lived in San Diego and I just rented everything that I had been and I'd circled an Asian cult cinema and couldn't find. And then one day I went in there and I, I asked them, I was like, hey, I'm looking for King Who's the Valiant One, uh, the Valiant Ones, do, do you happen to have that? And the guy just kind of looked at me and he was like, he's like, do you want to know where I buy all these from? And he's like, because I don't have everything you're looking for. And I was <laughs> like, well, what's this? Yeah. And he told me about this store that was in that was north of San Diego near the the Air Force Base or um, Miramar Airfield, and it was the store where this guy sold karaoke machines and rented kung fu movies. <laughs> <laughs> and this was right when the Celestial Pictures reissues of the Shaw Brothers movies were coming out, and so for the next like two years, I was a regular at this store. Where he was selling, where this guy was selling um, karaoke machines, and he he just put DVDs aside for me and say, and tell me, no, you want to see Heads for Sale? Like, just just no, just buy this. Yeah, don't don't ask me, just buy. Yeah, that's <laughs> and, great. 
Yeah, and I also had an amazing experience there one time where a Korean family was doing, um, grandma got ran over by a reindeer on the karaoke machine while I was browsing for movies. <laughs> And so I, I say this because like people don't who see every have access to everything on the internet don't realize you know the links to which we used to go to find these movies. Yeah. And well, and that was when what was it? It was early two thousands, right? When Celestial started releasing all that Shaw Brothers stuff. Yep. And that was incredible. It was all of a sudden I could just go on eBay and buy dvds of all the shaw brothers movies that i'd always wanted to watch and i could dive down the rabbit hole like that was incredible and subtitled and remastered and looking yeah. amazing yeah yeah and, yeah and that was another thing at that uh video store that was next door to that movie theater that i worked at you know they would had chinese movies japanese and taiwanese movies but a lot of them would be in original language and no subtitles or they'd be you know extremely like we've all gotten used to the chopped you know, those movies are always in cinema scope, but then they'd be chopped for the 4.3 TV, you know, and like third generation bootleg or whatever, and they'd look terrible. Um, so yeah, having those finally come out where they look great, that was amazing. You could actually yeah. watch those movies. Yeah, that yeah. was an incredible time when that finally happened. Yeah, yeah and people so- don't know now. Now people, yeah, they have, younger people have no idea what it used to be like to try to find stuff. And when we moved back to San Diego after being in Portland for a few years in 2014, one of the first places I went was to see if that store was still there and it wasn't. And I was very sad. Um, but, uh, but yeah, that guy, he rented movies and he sold movies, but it was, it was hilarious because I, when I, when he told me about the celestial thing coming out, I of course ordered five element ninjas first. That was my first Yeah. in, in, in that. And then, um, but you know, it was awesome to have a guy who was also like knowledgeable about the movies, and then, and when new movies were coming out too, this guy like he knew it. It was great, and it was like you know, it was a kind of a connection that that the fans of these movies they have, you know. Yeah. So let's talk about like how did you get into archiving, and and I promise I'll shut up at this point. I just uh, I I wanted to share because I think it's so fun for people to 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 know like just how you got to know how everybody got into this before we had the internet sure yeah definitely. yeah but so the archiving how did that happen was I, i'm sure it's because you're working in, in the the, in the projection projection booth right what was yeah the first i mean that's, movie that came through your projection booth yeah that never happened never one never came through until i started saving them um but um it was i started putting on events i worked as a projectionist forever and then you know, I was like, I want to do like a film festival or show movies that I, I like. And I want it to be about movies. That was like a big deal to me. I was like, I don't want it to be about selling fucking merch in the lobby. I don't want it to be about, you know, parties afterwards or whatever. People standing around drinking champagne, acting like film snobs. I was like, I want to show movies I love and give some movies respect that I feel like don't get respect. And so I started running out theaters and showing movies. I started showing exploitation movies and horror movies and all types of stuff. And, um, but what I really wanted to show more than anything were Kung Fu movies. And I quickly found that they did not exist on 35 millimeter, or if they did, nobody knew where they were. They were gone. I talked to all the major film archives and all the distributors and most of them just made fun of me. They were like Kung Fu movies. Like those are the movies that we would throw away. Like I had a, one of the major film archives tell me that and it like sent a chill through my body. Like nobody cares about these films. They're going to be lost. Like that's a horrible thing. And this was when the, they were starting to come out on DVD, but you know, mm. projecting DVD, I don't know. And, but not the independent stuff. The independent stuff was just gone. So I set out to try to save as many as I could. And um, I think part of it, because I grew up in that small town in the middle of nowhere and didn't have access to anything, I've always like thought differently about how to access things. Like then, you know, people ask me that all the time. How do you find rare 35 millimeter prints? Or how did you get in contact with this, you know, director or whatever? And like, to me, it's just, I think my brain works differently because of that experience growing up. So I just started doing the detective work. Like what happened to the prints? And so most of those films were either 
you know, the way it used to work was the movies would be shipped over from Hong Kong. And then there were a few different circuits that they would play throughout the country. But most of the theaters would buy the prints. And so there were just a couple of theater chains. They'd buy the films and they could play them throughout the country or throughout the U.S. and Canada. And then when they were done with them, finally, but that's how some movies would play for like three years on 42nd Street or whatever. But correct me here, because you're talking about the detective work. You had to figure out the distribution. You had to, to go back and figure out how these movies were distributed. Who did you talk to about that? Um, I started just researching online and reading just Hong Kong film books and I pieced it together mm -hmm. about how it worked. And so it was kind of working backwards. So I was like, first, like, you know, where did they end up, you know, at the right. end, right? And so then it was like, well, they were either left behind at the theaters, which happened and the theaters would close and the film would just be in there. And if the theater was demolished, then the film was thrown away. Or another common thing was they were done with the run. You take all the hundreds of prints and you put them on a barge and you dump them in the ocean. That was incredibly common. So I was like just doing the research and contacting theaters that I was like, this was the end of the line theater or warehouse. Like, do you still have film there? And so I started out finding uh, situations where it was too late. I found a warehouse in Northern California that was filled with film and it was amazing. It was this guy who was like, oh yeah, I got all the film. He's like, there's hundreds of film cans here. And I was like, all right, I'm so excited. So I drove down there and I get there and he stored them in this upstairs of this warehouse next to this huge bay of windows where the windows were all busted out. So uh. the film cans have been rained on for like 15 years. I was like, oh, like this film's ruined. It was all ruined. They were just rusty film cans with moldy film, like unplayable. You couldn't even read most of the cans to see what was there. Any movies out of that? No, they were all, they were destroyed, completely destroyed. So that was terrible. Um, so I had a few situations like that. Um, but then, I mean, then I finally found my huge score was finding uh, the Shaw Brothers prints. Cause I was like, what happened to those, right? Shaw Brothers released hundreds upon hundreds of Kung Fu movies in the seventies and early eighties or sixties through early eighties, actually martial arts films. Um, but there were only like two, three prints in the US, there was nothing. And so I was trying to figure it out and there was, should I just tell this whole story? Am I doing oh yes, story? we're gonna go, I mean, I have questions through <laughs> as a part of this, let's let's go deep. Okay. Get all the details like. Yeah, so this was, I mean, I've told this story, you know, at the Hollywood and stuff and I've traveled and told it, but so there was a guy selling uh, Shaw Brothers trailers online and so those are incredibly hard to find mm -hmm. and they were all in their original film cans um, so I bought some from them and they were in great condition it was really amazing and I was like hey where did you get these and he had the posters too I was like he pulled these out he got these out of a theater for sure mm -hmm. and he stopped responding to my emails as soon as I asked him where he got them so I'm like okay he, he stole them from someone he got into a theater and stole these and he was in Vancouver, BC. And so did some more research and found out that there was a Shaw Brothers theater that had been in Vancouver. So Shaw Brothers, which was owned by Run Run Shaw in Hong Kong, um, had their own chain of theaters in uh, Hong Kong and Singapore, but then they also opened up a chain of theaters in the US and Canada. And so he had sent his niece over to run that theater chain. And so once I found that out, I tracked her down. Um, oh, I forgot to say the most important part about how, how I had my first key was one of the film cans that he sent me was actually the trailer for Five Element Ninjas, Chinese Super Ninjas. And in the film can was a movie ticket that said Shaw Theater on it. So that's how I knew. I was like, okay, he stole these out of the old Shaw Brothers Theater. So anyway, so I, through the power of Google, tracked down Run Run Shah's niece, who had run the North American theater chain and spent like six months emailing her every once in a while. She finally responded, got back to me. 
and said she wasn't involved with the company anymore. She had no idea what I was talking about, if there was any film, but she put me in touch with Run Run Shaw's office in Hong Kong. Um, and this is Run Run was still alive. Um, this has been 11 years or whatever, um, which he lived to be like 106 before he passed away. Wow. Um, so anyway, so I got in touch with Run Run Shaw's office and they didn't know what was going on, but they mailed me a key and sent me the address. They're like, this is where the old theater is. They had sold off all their other movie theaters, closed them down, and they had that one building left that they owned in Vancouver. So I drove up there. Yeah. Yeah, and I have one aside here that I, maybe you can solve this mystery for me because you might yeah. be the only person that can answer this, but... Growing up in Indiana, when I was a little kid, I have a distinct memory of seeing Super Inframan in the theater at some point, but I can't explain how it ended up playing in a theater in Indiana. Was it possible that that these movies made it out to, to mall theaters and stuff like that? Because I remember seeing that movie and at the mall in, yeah. in Indiana. Is that possible? Because yeah, some of, the, some of them did. Some would get, it was certain titles would get different distributors. Like Five Fingers of Death, Warner Brothers picked that up and released it because mm -hmm. um, it was originally King Boxer, right? Warner Brothers bought it, retitled it Five Fingers of Death and released it. That was the first Hong Kong movie to blow up in America. Um, and then like, yeah, Inframan, was one, I can't remember who distributed it, but there were a few, like a few Ching Che movies, Kid with the Golden Arm. Um, there was uh, World Northall was a company that bought a bunch of Shaw Brothers titles and they dubbed them and released them in theaters. So that may have been a World Northall, I'm not positive. I have a print of Inframan, I'd have to look at it, but yeah, that happened with certain titles, but that wouldn't be majority of Shaw Brothers stuff. Majority of that stuff only played in either the Chinese theaters or like the grindhouses on 42nd street. I'm, I mean, I'm positive too, that I've seen your print of Inframan because I saw it at the Laurelhurst uh, theater and I'm sure it was your print. <laughs> it wasn't mine. No. Was it? Really? Yeah. That's somebody else's. Yeah. Oh. Well, in, in Inframan, like I, when I tell people that I saw it as a kid in the theater, a lot of people would be, would be like, ah, that doesn't sound believable, but <laughs> it is. I, I remember it in, in Inframan also has the, um, for Indiana has the title of being the only movie that was shown on both Sammy Terry and Black Belt Theater. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you can, you can do either one with this. That's great. Yeah, because yeah, it has big giant monsters and, yeah. and um, but I remember that uh, Sammy Terry fans were very bothered that it wasn't a traditional horror movie. And if there had been Twitter at the time, there would have been outrage. Uh, <laughs> yeah, but uh, right. but there wasn't. So okay, so you got the key. This this is important. You got the key. I, to the... Got the key to the theater. So I drove up. Um, my wife went with me. We had just met like two months before. She went with me. <laughs> like, look what you got into. <laughs> you know, it's it's funny because then, not to go into that too much, but the night we had met, she had told me she always wanted to be a film archivist. That was her dream. And right. I was like, oh, that's what I do. And then <laughs> we went through this experience. And I think, you know, my method of film archiving is not glamorous at all. Like it's guerrilla style. It's nasty and dirty. And I don't, <laughs> I think it was not the most. Well, that's know. why I, that's why I say you're the Indiana Jones of, of Kung Fu movies. <laughs> right. but, uh... But, uh, but anyway, so we drove up to Vancouver right? Got to the old Shaw Brothers Theater. It'd been closed since um, 1985, and this was 2009. Um, and the theater's on Hastings Street, which if you've ever been to Vancouver, that's their skid row. And so I'd even seen a show on uh, Discovery Channel that showed that theater, showed footage of it, and it said that that four block area where that theater is has the highest concentrated use of heroin in North America. So it was, you know, literally like Vancouver has pushed all, all that element into that one area. So if you go to Hastings Street and it's people like shooting up everywhere and smoking rock and it's just a sea of zombies. It's really, it's horrifying. But so anyway, go, so my wife's like, what is this? To horrible? get these movies. <laughs> <laughs> you do what you gotta do. Yeah. So go inside the theater. 
Terra panel. Well, first looked around a little bit, and then at the front of the auditorium there was a stage, and so I tore a panel off the stage, and all the film was underneath. There was over a thousand reels of film stuffed underneath the stage. So we went through them, you know, reel by reel. It was all completely disorganized. You know, a 35 millimeter print is five or six reels long. And so at first I didn't know, like, is there, are there complete movies here? Like we had to go through, write every real title and real number down. And we were there a couple hours before I found out, okay, we do actually have complete prints here. So went back. Which is amazing. You know, just in the, just finding them in the first place before restoring them, any of that, just the, 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 what must you have been feeling when, when you're, I mean, I know you're probably a little bit worried about like having to navigate the heroin addicts and everything else that's going on, but you had to have been like shitting your pants with excitement. <laughs> you know, you would think so, but honestly, I was more overwhelmed than anything. Like really? film, film is a pain in the ass. I always tell people that um, it's heavy. It takes a ton of work. It takes up so much space. You know, I mean, an average 35 millimeter print weighs 40, 45 pounds for one movie. It takes up room. Like, you know, I was like, we got to get all the, like, this is a semi truck. This is huge. You know, this is like, you know, this is going to take forever. It just seemed overwhelming. You know, I mean, I, I once, I got back and I had thrown some films in the trunk of my car just in case, you know, I was like, what if this is my only chance at this and it doesn't work out. And I, if I, I was like, I will hang myself if it turns out I didn't bring some prints back with me. So no, I that, that leads to the work. question. What did you put in the trunk the first time? What was the first, movie that first one I threw in right away? As soon as I had it complete, I took it out was eight diagram pole fighter, which is my favorite uh, Kung Fu movie. So that uh, eight diagram pole fighter, um, five element ninjas, Chinese super ninjas, uh, 36 chamber of Shaolin and fist of the white Lotus definitely were, I threw in, there were a couple more, but those for sure I threw in right away. Cause I was so like, I know for a fact that I watched your prints of eight diagram pole fighter and fist of the white Lotus, because I saw them at your yeah. screens at, at, and at the Hollywood theater. I have the, I have the only ones. You're not going to see any more. Those, those are the only prints of those movies. Wow. If there are any prints of those movies, they're, they belonged to Celestial Pictures and they donated everything they had to the Hong Kong Film Archive, who doesn't loan out prints. So it's possible there may be prints of it there, but you'd have to go to the Hong Kong Film Archive. And they're and not giving it up. That they're showing it or whatever. So I have the only other ones. And mo most of those prints I found were absolutely the only prints in the western hemisphere and some of them were the only prints that exist incredible, incredible. And, and the most amazing thing is they were in really good shape like the weirdest part about it was being vancouver has pretty mellow weather low humidity which humidity destroys film and the fact that they were just under that stage they weren't in film cans or anything is actually like ideal film storage conditions it was really weird yeah, it was almost like meant to be. And yeah. but I think people should take note too that by explaining which ones you put in the trunk, you gave a very perfect five movies to start with. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. If you're wondering like, where do I start with this? Like those movies, yeah, are exactly where you start. Okay. So, um, and I remember reading about this in the Willamette Week when, when, it, when it first happened and just being like i remember at the time i i remember thinking like how do i become this guy's friend <laughs> <laughs> like, how, how do i start seeing these movies and then so, i think somewhere down the line it was like oh he's gonna start doing screenings and then i was like okay well that's good enough i'll go to the screenings <laughs> and um <laughs> and uh but it was just amazing that you were able to get these so you were daunted of course by the task of so now you drive home, you've got your five prints of, of your, like, I'm going to save these. Then you have to start planning, like, what am I going to do with the rest of these? Exactly. So, so what did so, you do next? So it was like a, maybe two weeks later, I went back with a friend of mine. My wife sat out this trip. Um, 
And I ordered a bunch of cardboard boxes to be delivered to the theater and lined up a semi truck. Oh, and I talked to um, the Alamo Draft House's film archive, the American Genre Film Archive. They had just started that. And so we had had to team up on the whole thing to make it happen for how Shaw Brothers was donating the movies. But yeah. anyway, that part of it was complicated. But lined up a semi truck. So I went there with my friend Leno pulled out all the film, organized everything. It took two days, which was quicker than I thought it was going to be. Um, and then it was 8,000 pounds of film. So, which is, you know, incredible. And so the semi showed up and the truck driver was like, I'm not taking this. He's like, it's too heavy. He's like, I got other stuff I have to put on a truck. Like, nope. And I was like, you're not leaving without this film. I was like, this is absolute. this is it. I was like, this is my shot. Like, we're doing it. And so we argued for a little bit and he agreed. And so it was this whole process of, you know, bringing out a pallet of prints and then the lift gate didn't really work very well. So it would take like 15 minutes to put each pallet of prints on the truck. Now the junkies were everywhere. So by the time we would get one pallet on the truck, by the time I was ready to bring out the next pallet, I had to have, I had to go get a push broom so I could sweep the needles out of the way so we could bring out the next pallet. That was how crazy it was. Now well, people think, oh no, there are a couple of people and like, no, it was a sea of people. Like just sitting there shooting up, you know, smoking rock. It was insanity. Yeah. So. Well, and and um, another thing to think about at this point is that all these prints also survived um, what I know you refer to as the, um, or was, has been referred to as the Mona Fong destruction tour. Yes. Shaw Brothers had, had attempted to destroy these. So do you have any idea like how Mona Fong missed Vancouver or was she was, scared away by the heroin addicts or what, 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 how did those not get destroyed? It was because it was the one building they had never sold. They still owned it. Oh, that's why they had the key. Yep. So they, they had owned the chain of theaters and then mid 80s when they stopped theatrical production, they closed down all their theaters and they sold them off. And so they called it the Mona Fong Destruction Tour. That was actually Run Run Shaw's right hand man that I was in touch with. He called it that. And so Mona Fong, who is she was Run Run Shaw's wife later on. And she was in charge of Kung Fu movies. You'll see her name in credit. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. She was the head of production for years and years and years. So she produced everything. So she, but she personally came over and went to each theater when it was sold off. And if there was any film there, she made sure it was destroyed. And so that actually happened. Cause I was like, is there more of this? Are there more prints maybe in the U S and they're like, no, Mona Fong absolutely made sure they were all destroyed. So this was the only building, like luckily they never sold it or these would have all, been dumped in the ocean or you know tossed in a landfill or whatever so that was lucky mm -hmm. but um yeah so we got them all out of there and then yeah the story i always tell is getting them across the border was you know pages and pages of paperwork since it was all in the truck and um i had i got home and i'm checking the tracking and it's like oh it's still at customs and then I had to get somebody on the phone like the next day, it's still at customs, like what is going on? And they tell me, I had to give them a list of films with the driver and they said, oh, it was all flagged as porn <laughs> because of the movie Dirty Ho. And so you can't, you know, import porn, I guess, I don't know. So um, I had to, you know, I'm, I'm like arguing with the people at customs, like what about Dirty Ho is actually a lighthearted Kung Fu comedy about a nefarious character named Ho, you know, but I'm just trying to explain that to them. And they were like, no, 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 it's porn or whatever. But somehow some mistake happened where it got through. Like that about eight diagram pole fighter or something. <laughs> right. Well, they didn't see that one was in the truck of my car. They never saw that one. So yeah, it didn't have, it was on the list, but um, they were, they said that it was still being hung up after a couple of days. But then at a certain point, I noticed that the tracking was, they got through. And so I stopped talking to them about it on the phone and whatever it made it so dirty ho made it through but so, um that's funny yeah. to talk to the uh, customs agents about well you see it's it's a one car long comedy and exactly <laughs> yeah. yeah try to explain that to them yeah 
and repeat that. <laughs> That's hilarious. <laughs> uh, so then they got across the border and yeah. they got back to Portland. What was the next step in like taking care of these? Prints? Well, a bunch went down to Austin because of the American Genre Film Archive, and I didn't have room for them. Yeah. And so mine, so what I did is I've worked at the Hollywood Theater forever. Um, that was before I was the head programmer there, but I was the technical director, I had projectionist, and I put on events there. And so the Hollywood had gone through some really dark times, um, had become a real rundown theater. And so there was a huge basement, though. But the basement was just filled with garbage, like decades of people just throwing marquee letters and theater seats and whatever down there. And so me and another guy um, pulled everything out of there and cleaned up the basement. And I was like, this is actually like perfect film storage down here. You know, it's like, it's actually a pretty nice space and it stays the same temperature all the time. And again, no humidity. And so I turned it into my film archive. So a lot of people don't know that. Most people don't know that, but uh, don't, don't go see for yourself. But uh, <laughs> the basement of the Hollywood is my Kung Fu film archive. Is that right underneath the big rooms, uh, the big? No, building, it's under another part of the building. Okay. <laughs> yeah, it's old theaters have odd layouts and designs and kind of labyrinths. Like well, and I should say that I have lots of fond memories of the Hollywood Theater because in my seven years in Portland, I saw um, a lot of my, between the Lovecraft Film Fest and between like everything. I mean, that huge room, that the main screen is where I resaw Prince of Darkness and The Thing and and um, uh, Fist of the White Lotus and 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 you know um, your the trailer parks that you did, which were amazing. Um, because even like my wife who doesn't like kung fu movies, I could take her to the trailer park and like you know and yeah. and you're still laughing and you're having a good time and and so like I had a lot of great times in that in that particular theater, not to mention the, the new releases I saw there, I saw The Devil or whatever yeah. let, that you guys were showing that nobody else was showing. So yeah. well, I think memories for the Hollywood. I, I, think, I think it's now, it's a perfect theater. Cause you know, I've been programming there 10 years. We got a new executive director at that point. It's a nonprofit and we cleaned it up, right? We put in new seats and screens and everything and like put in 70 millimeter and all that. Now, I think for the last, you know, it's been like nine years or whatever, I think it's like the perfect place to see a movie. There's a 50 foot screen, the seats are comfortable, the sounds great, there's film, you know, you can have a beer. I think it's the perfect environment to watch a movie. But that giant screen goes a long way for like, you're watching like five element ninjas on a 50 foot screen with 400 people. Like, that's amazing. Well, and you guys have done a good job of keeping contemporary with a lot of this stuff. I remember seeing the raid there before, like the buzz had gotten out and just, yeah. you know, um, or I saw the devil, for example, is one that I saw there that, you know, oh yeah, yep, yeah, that's you right. You know, that, you know, there wasn't really a ton of buzz out there, but like it just made me glad that I lived in Portland at that time. Like I was able to have those experiences, but we'll get more into actual like movie. Well, maybe we can now because like now you've got the archive, you've got, so some of them have gone to Austin, but you can, um, you can access those whenever you want, right? Yeah. To do it. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that was part of the deal as I have free access to them whenever I want. And yeah. I've found a lot more films too. Like that was just one film discovery. I mean, that was like a big one, Yeah. but I've, you know, found... Sometimes it's just a print or two where I'll find somebody. I, I had a really great connection for a while, a guy in the Bay Area who he was an older guy and he didn't really care about Kung Fu movies, but he used to raid dumpsters outside movie theaters and outside the old film transfer, film depot, which there used to be film depots in all the major cities. And he would raid the dumpsters on Thursday nights for years and years and years in the 70s and 80s and he would just keep whatever film that he found there and so he had tons of kung fu movies i bought so many great prints from him i got kid with the golden arm and crippled avengers and i can't remember what seven grandmasters i got from him a bunch of independent stuff that hasn't been able to have nobody else has been able to find and um yeah and then i bought prints from a guy in Taiwan who had pulled some 
prints out of a theater and then a guy in the UK who had films. So like my collection is coming from all over the world. It makes me happy that it's all in one place. And I've actually been able to find like most of the best, not all of them, but most of the best kung fu, classic Kung Fu films. Right. And then your recent, um, in the new Beverly, uh, pure cinema interview that you did with, uh, Quentin Tarantino, I, I, I know, uh, and it's a movie that you guys sent me to, uh, recently it was Beach of the War Gods. Like if you're listening to the interview, you can hear you and Quentin, like kind of try and break down where that movie might be. Right. Like, <laughs> yeah. And, you know, Quentin's like, I think it only got released in England, you know, and so you're going to have to go through there. And, I'm sure with each title, the new title that you're trying to track down, you have to do that detective work. Like, where did it screen? Where, you know, where was it released? And exactly, yeah, yeah, because that movie is now a dream print for me to find. Beach of the War Gods, and it's I think incredible. he is right. It's an incredible movie, and it's you can see it on YouTube. Um, you know, as far as if you just want to see the movie, yeah, right. Um, and uh, what. You know, Jimmy Wang Yu is, you know, a big star, like classic Kung Fu movie. And then, you know, like when I'm listening to you guys talk about this, I'm like, how did I never hear of this movie as, as, a, as a Kung Fu movie nerd? And it's what it taught me was that even though I've been obsessed with these movies for 25 years, 30 years, there's still movies out there that somebody's going to be like, hey, have you heard of this one? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, there were so many of those movies made. I mean, there were just so many exploitation movies made in the 70s and 80s. I feel like you can spend your whole life watching them and you're always going to find more. And the same is with Kung Fu movies. You know, again, Shaw Brothers, just that one studio made like whatever it is, six or 700 Kung Fu movies. Um, and then there's Golden Harvest and then there's all the independent stuff. You know, I know at my monthly Kung Fu theater, some guy came up to me once and he was like, so are there any bad Kung Fu movies? And I was like, oh, wow, you do not know how lucky you are. <laughs> yeah, you're lucky. So I keep you from having to see the really bad ones. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> I thought that was an amazing question. So then, yeah, I mean, you know, I watch these movies all, all, or I used to watch them all the time. I still watch them a lot. And there's still more, you know, you always find more. Yeah. Well, awesome. and, and I don't know if you were involved in this, but one of the cool things that happened in that for me in Kung Fu movies in Portland was right after I moved to Portland, Somebody told me like, oh yeah, um, the Clinton Street Theater has a, um, on Thanksgiving, they show Kung Fu movies all day long and you just pay one price and you go in and out. Um, and since I'm not a Thanksgiving guy, um, like I was like, that's amazing. And so every year that I was in Portland, like part of my routine was going at least part of the day to see these. And the first year that I went, I think it was the first year there was a Sonny Sheba movie. I think it was The Bodyguard, but also there was a Godfrey Ho movie. And on the flyer, you know, they just put ninjas versus tanks. <laughs> right? That's and, great. Um, so were you involved in that or is that somebody else who was just- That was um, Seth that owned the Clinton Street at that time. He was a friend of mine, but he was just showing DVDs and VHS yeah. tapes. Okay. Um, I did loan him a print once. That was when I was first starting collecting. That was a long time ago. Yeah. Um, so there was one Thanksgiving where he showed one of my prints. Um, I can't remember what it was. It was so long ago. But um, but yeah, I went to a couple of those too. Yeah. Yeah. And, and just, um, and for me, it was like um, that Thanksgiving was the day that opened my eyes to the insanity that is Godfrey Ho, right? Yeah. I just didn't even know like, there's this guy who's made 80 movies in Hong Kong that all have ninja in the title <laughs> yeah. and uses stock footage from the same movie like 30 times. Yeah. And like, so as far as bad Kung Fu movie goes, you can't really do better than, <laughs> than Godfrey Ho. Godfrey he, Ho. He made a movie I really like, uh, The Dragon, The Hero, which I have a 35 millimeter print of it. And that movie's very different from his other films. It's great. I highly recommend that movie. I haven't seen that like, one. Oh yeah, it's really good. How come you didn't do this more? Yeah, really? like you could actually make good movies. So that would be kind of like if Ed Wood just suddenly had a like a Citizen Kane, right? Exactly, yeah. Like, yeah. wow, this is really good. Um, but one story about Seth who owned the Clinton Street Theater at that time. He moved away, he doesn't live in Portland anymore. 
mm -hmm. doesn't work in theaters, but he and I, because we'd always heard all the stories about the older guys who used to go to the film depot and pull films out of the dumpster. So he and I used to try to go do that when there was still a film depot in Portland. We would go on certain nights and try to raid the dumpster, but we never got we never got anything good out of there. <laughs> we got some splicers. We got some equipment, actually, some empty reels, but no actual good film. And people who are listening should know that this Thanksgiving marathon in the Clinton Street Theater, the Clinton Street Theater is a great hole in the wall, like, I say this lovingly, crappy theater. <laughs> that it's actually nicer now. They've actually fixed it up. It's I've heard that. Yeah. <laughs> but at the time, it was like a perfect place to see like a shitty Godfrey Ho movie. <laughs> oh, yeah. It was like freezing cold. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it was a great experience. And, um, but uh, yeah, so just, um, you know, we've gone pretty long. So I want to, I do want to get into talk about some actual movies instead of just like the archiving and just to give people a feel because um, classic Kung Fu movies, um, people, some, might be thinking like, yeah, I, I'm into it, but what, well, what ones should I see? And I want to start with, um, and I know Quentin is famous for saying that Shang Shea is the Leone and like the, the John Ford of Kung Fu movies. So let's start with Shang Shea. What are, he's a director who made over like 70 or 80 movies. Right? Uh, around a hundred. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what are his classics that that you think people should see starting there with him well it's probably a longer answer than you're looking for but he had a really fascinating career because he had a bunch of different um compartments to his career like he started off when he really started making martial arts movies in the 60s he made some really amazing sword play movies so like the one-armed swordsman is a really great when I was talking to Tarantino he had made some comment about uh Master of the Flying Guillotine isn't a movie that he would recommend to like Peter Bogdanovich and I was so I was like well what martial arts movie would you recommend to Peter Bogdanovich and he was like oh One Armed Swordsman would be like it's a like an art film and it's a drama and it's really powerful so anyway so Cheng Che had that period then he had like this in the early 70s like where he made all these epics, like the heroic ones that you mentioned, that are like more than just kung fu movies. They're like, like a like a maybe not like a Lawrence of Arabia, but that type, like epic film. They might they're like two hours long, but they're a lot more than your typical kung fu movie. Like there's a lot of drama happening. Now and also like kind of the the director in that era that was known for being kind of the Kurosawa of China was King Hu. Right, and done like a touch of Zen, which is a masterpiece and an amazing movie. And like, because I like those serious, like epic kung fu movies too, not just the the, the fun ones. But um, Cheng Che did a sequel to um, to King Hu's Come Drink with Me, the Golden Sw Golden Swallow, that I yeah. think is is every bit as good as as King Hu's original movie. I think the Golden Swallow is a very underrated um Shang Chi movie too I completely agree yeah it's another one of those movies like same thing like why isn't this hi as highly regarded as the other films I never understand that yeah but yeah. And, and I know it's a sequel but I think it's every bit as good as come drink with me it's a little different it doesn't have the songs it doesn't have those things but it's the same characters and it continues the story and, and I think it's it, it's an underrated Shang Chi film absolutely uh, and, and it stands maybe, on its own too. You don't have to see the other film. You can still appreciate it yeah. on its own and know what's going on. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and so he did these epics and then um, he kind of transitioned in, the, in, well, he continued to do, he did other classics too. Like, was well, it, then he started making Shaolin Temple movies, which that's my favorite phase in his career is he made like Shaolin Temple, also known as Death Chamber, Five Masters of Death, Heroes 2, Shaolin Martial Arts. So he made like a whole string of movies. He was making like four or five movies a year. Mm -hmm. And a bunch of those like early to mid 70s that were all about the destruction of Shaolin Temple, which is a huge event in the history of martial arts and the fallout from that and fighting against priest Pai Mei and everything. Um, and that those movies are my favorite Chen Chen movies. And those again are more serious they're more like, maybe you don't start with those, but once you find out, okay, I like these movies, then watch those and you'll know if you like them. 
And then he went on to, then he had his final phase where he made his Venoms films. He made Five Deadly Venoms, which at that point, those movies were just all about entertaining the audience. And then he, that was such a hit. And he made a bunch of movies with the same group of actors and they're known as the Venoms films, like Five Element Ninjas, Kid with the Golden Arm, Crippled Avengers, Masked Avengers, so many movies. And those are super fun. Yeah, those are those are definitely some of the more fun movies. And, uh, you, you know, there's a reason why Five Element Ninjas is one of the foundational ones for both of us, because it's 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 a movie that it's just um, uh, it's just incredibly fun to watch. Um, and also, like, I think it was a great transition at that time for those of those of us kids who grew up on ninja movies through definitely HBO. So that was important. <laughs> now. Other directors, other Shaw Brothers movies. Let's let's finish out. What are some like Shaw Brothers movies that aren't from the big names, maybe, or or well, just uh, besides Shang Shang. What are some other Shaw Brothers classics you feel people must see? Yeah, well, of course, the Lau Kar Long movies, like A Diagram Pole Fighter. He was my favorite director from mm -hmm. this time. Um, Fist of the White Lotus, which was Lole's only movie he ever directed. Um, what else from Shaw Brothers? Well, Fist of the White Lotus is good for people that are into very strange and weird. Like, like if you're trying to bridge the gap between people who like the horror movies and the weird stuff from that era, Fist of the White Lotus is very good for people who like Super Bizarro. Definitely. <laughs> yeah. And uh, that sect, of course, return, or you, some people might know it from uh, Once Upon a Time in China too. For example, um, uh, Jet Li based off of the same like White Lotus cult. Right. And, um, that or, or, or Kill Bill, right? Gordon Liu played the same character, played Pai Mei in, in Kill Bill. It comes from that movie, from Executioner's Shaolin and Fist of the White Lotus. Oh, and that's a classic too, Executioner's yeah. Shaolin. Uh -huh. um, just uh, it's a really good. Um, and uh, I shout out to, to my guy who ran the karaoke store. He was totally right for me. One of my favorite Shaw Brothers movies of that era is Heads for Sale, which oh, yeah. also has the title of the best, had the best title from the Shaw Brothers movie. <laughs> it, yeah. Is Heads for Sale. Have you seen a print of that one? Because that's one no. of my favorites now. No. I mean, outside of, I guess I have found some other Shaw Brothers prints, but um, no, I haven't seen that. Um, and they, they made other movies too. I mean, you know, we're talking about kung fu movies, but it is good to know Shaw Brothers made horror movies and dramas and crime movies and romances, and they made all types of stuff. You know, huge movie studio, right? Absolutely. Okay, yeah. so now let's talk about some of these independent, well, like Golden Harvest and the independent studios too, like, because like, it's easy to just focus on Shaw Brothers because we were lucky with Celestial Pictures that they they brought all these back into consciousness definitely but, but part of your job now as an archivist is like finding these independent movies what are the ones that have been the, i know a, a, a diagram pole fighter i was there for the first time you showed it at the hollywood and it brings the house down that final reel is just incredible yeah, yeah. and um the final act of that is just amazing but You've also brought some independent ones out there. What are some ones, that, independent ones, that have really worked well? Uh, well, I think, I think a good segue is because the one Shaw Brothers movie I forgot to mention was Chinese Boxer, directed uh -huh. by Jimmy Wang Yu, which was the first hand-to-hand -hand Shaw Brothers kung fu movie. Um, but then he left the studio; he had a falling out and started making movies independently or with Golden Harvest. And so he made Master of the Flying Guillotine. He made Beach of the War Gods, which we talked about both of those. Um, highly recommended. Like those movies are incredible. And he's such an amazing filmmaker. And I do have a print of Master of the Flying Guillotine. Um, but other independent directors, Lee Sao Nam is one of the best. And he made just a string of great movies. Phantom Kung Fu, The Hot, The Cool, and The Vicious. Um, what's the uh, Fatal Needles versus Fatal Fists, um, Invincible, or uh, uh, yeah, Invincible Kung Fu Legs, which I have a print of that one. And I have a print of his uh, Shaolin versus Llama, which is an amazing movie. But I'm always trying to find more of his stuff. Um, he was just, he's one of those directors that just, you know, nobody's going to celebrate except Tarantino and just an amazing filmmaker. Mm -hmm. um, 
he's probably my favorite purely independent who never worked at an actual studio hong kong filmmaker right and and so the, but there was also i, I don't know so because so, because you've done a lot of these older films and got into these older films and i know we're going to be i'm going to be doing an episode on this podcast about late century um hong kong movies are there any from that era that that from the like the 80s and 90s that that you have screened or shown um some of the golden harvest stuff eastern condors um dragons forever which is a jackie chan samuel hung film which the ending of that movie is just in, that's like the ending of pole fighter it blows the roof off mm -hmm. um so i've shown those i haven't shown a lot prodigal son is another one from that time period um I am. I actually have found a huge collection of Golden Harvest prints, but haven't been able to get them yet. It's something I've been working on for years, and so I want to bring a lot of those movies to the screen. But so far, hasn't been possible. My favorite all-time kung fu movie is a Golden Harvest release from 1982, and that would be Duel to the Death. The oh, that's a great movie. Yeah, yeah. Um, and that is my all-time favorite kung fu movie um, up there with Star Trek: Wrath of Khan as a movie that I can watch anytime. Yeah, um, and over and over. Uh, uh, Duel to the Death, I think, is incredibly underrated. Uh, and you mentioned Eastern Condors, which is another favorite of mine. Um, I still, I think the uh, landlord from Kung Fu Hustle's um, husband, who plays the the crazy general <laughs> in Eastern Condors, is worth the price of admission, but also has the most brutal stabbing in a movie of all time. <laughs> um, Eastern Condors. Uh, at, it just has to be seen to be, be believed. Um, uh, I think that's a super underrated one, and we'll talk more about that one in my Hong Kong in our Hong Kong episode. Cool. But um, but yeah, I think during that um, that era too. Well, it's funny too because I think some of those early uh, Jackie Chan movies they do really well at these screens. I've seen some of those, but it's funny because I think people forget that he was working in the seventies and he was doing these things. And it's interesting to see how he was kind of developing his style. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, they originally wanted him to be the next, like the next Bruce Lee, right? So it was serious. And those movies just do not work with Jackie Chan. But one of my favorites is Snake in the Eagle's Shadow. There's another classic um, independent Jackie Chan film. That movie's so much fun. That's when he, his first movie where he tried to do, you know implement the comedy and it works so well. That movie's super fun and there's tons of fight scenes. Um, and there's, a, you know, another director, uh, Joseph Kuo is another one of my favorite independent directors who directed Seven Grandmasters and Mystery of Chess Boxing and Born Invincible. He made a string of really amazing movies in Taiwan independently and much lower budget than like a Shaw Brothers film. But the fight choreography is incredible. Uh, one that you guys sent me to on the Pure Cinema interview was uh, Soul Brothers of Kung Fu, which is... Oh, yeah. Same director as uh, China, uh, uh, Super Emperor Man, um, yep. which as soon as I saw that, I was like, okay, now I'm checking that one out. And uh, that's a prime example of a movie that uses like ripped off Hollywood, <laughs> you know, like the movie actually uses the music from Rocky, which is hilarious. And, <laughs> yeah. um, a lot of Kung Fu movies did that. They would, they would use like Ennio Morricone music and then they'd, then you'd hear, hear like a theme from Star Wars and then, you know, it was bizarre. Some Tangerine Dream will be thrown in there. It's really strange. Which, and Quentin recently repaid that by using a music cue from Eastern Condors and Inglorious Bastards. And um, I count myself as one of the few people in the world who like almost stood up and started applauding when, when <laughs> this like five second music cue from yeah. Eastern Condors. It's a really cool, it's a really cool guitar riff. Yeah, it's awesome. Yeah, yeah that someday, um, uh, yeah, someday I, I hope to be able to do those kinds of things in movies. Uh, <laughs> a uh, novelist hoping to uh, get into movies. But um, anywho, uh, one of the fun things about some of these movies too when they screen is that they have moments that um, I, I would say like when I saw Five Element Ninjas for the first time with an audience after years of watching it, like I had moments where I was like, I know the laughter is about to come. I know people are about to um, 
because I, I remember very specifically at a moment with Five Element Ninjas where I knew the guy was about to say, I've been poisoned. I cannot use my Kung Fu for at least two weeks. And I like knew that was going to cause laughter. Like as, a, as somebody who's screened these movies a bunch of times, like how is it, do you still enjoy like knowing these moments are coming? Like, do you have like a rhythm for when you, when you do these screenings where you know moments are going to kill like um yeah about that i mean i really i feel like i'm really lucky with the audience in portland and again i you know until the pandemic i did those monthly kung fu theater shows on the second tuesday of the month for nine years i've been doing that and last few years they've sold out every single time 400 people like that's insane but I really, I love the crowd. Like, I feel like it's, people are respectful of the movie, but having fun. Like, I feel like you don't want to go too far. You know what I mean? You don't want to be like the don't laugh. You know what I mean? We're taking this so seriously. This like, it's a Kung Fu movie. It should still be fun, you know? And no movie is more fun with the audience than a Kung Fu movie, you know, where the energy really gets going in the audience. It's like electricity. You feel it in the crowd. And like a final fight scene where everybody's cheering is really fun. So, I mean, you know, sometimes there might be some laughter. I just feel like the audience is, I don't know, people who are only going to laugh. I feel like they might come once and then they're never going to come back. And I actually, I overheard this person one time at the Hollywood and they said, you know, I used to, I came to one of those Kung Fu movies once, but everybody was taking it seriously. Like, if you're not going to laugh at it, then what's the point of coming? And I was like, I'm so glad you don't come anymore. Because there's also a thing of, you know, it's like when I found out film archives weren't taking the movies seriously. And if I hear about people just want to laugh at the movies, like, you know, you're probably just saying that you're racist. You know, you're just dissing another culture and making fun of it. You know, I mean, there's one thing of like, it's, it is, for another culture it might seem weird or it's from the time period right like if you're watching a venoms movie and everybody has gigantic sideburns and bell bottoms like they didn't actually dress that way in 16th century china you know what i mean right. obviously cocaine played a big influence in some of this stuff but you know it's still like it's fun but also we're taking it seriously so i think there's a mix right right so i feel like i'm lucky with the audience here where there might be somebody who shows up and it's their first time and they're laughing, but I feel like they get it after a while. Like they realize like other people aren't mocking the movie, right? Well, and I think personally, I laugh a lot when I see Kung Fu movies, but I'm I'm not laughing at it. I'm laughing with it. I, exactly. Like, That's the difference, right? Yeah. Right. And and I think, um, you know, there's different there's different styles of the, the old school. Like I love, um, for example, I mentioned earlier, A Touch of Zen is one of my favorites and that's a very serious yeah. uh, Kung Fu movie from the era. But at the same time, like I can love A Touch of Zen and I can also like, um, you know, Executioners from Shaolin or, or like one of the young auntie comedies or, or, or whatever, like you know, you have different movies and, and you can get into it. It's just like anything else. There's hundreds of movies to choose from. So, yeah. You know, and, you, you and, know. and there's there's things like, I forget about it because I get so used to watching the movies where, you know, there'll be like a bunch of Zooms, like three intense Zooms right in a row that if you watch the movies all the time, you might not even think about it. But then when you watch it with a crowd and they laugh and you're like, oh yeah, that's a pretty that's strange pretty cinematic yeah. choice. <laughs> well, and I'll tell you the one thing for for the pandemic and not being able to see movies in the theater. And I know it's different for other people, but as a writer, um, I pay attention to how the crowd reacts to movies. And I think, you know, any person that wants to screenwrite or or even writing novels or whatever, like you, you need to be able to pay attention and understand how a movie works in audience. And yeah. it's one of the reasons why it's important for me to go opening nights to big movies like, um, and that's one thing that, that I definitely miss. So I think, and one of the things that was great about your Kung Fu theater in the years that, that I was going was is that, you know, like you said, you watch these movies a hundred times you can forget sometimes like how things can get a reaction, you know? Totally. And, um, but at the same time, it's still important to, 
it's exciting that we have access to all these movies on YouTube now. So at least on our own, we can, you know, at this time, like people can still like find these ones. And I had to, I'm usually a person that hates dubbing. I don't, I, I prefer to watch movies subtitled and, you know, I, I can get over. And I think it was important in your, uh, their podcast with Quentin was that, um, when he said, yeah, just get the laughter out of the way, just kind of get it, you know. And recently I kind of decided, because I used to just avoid dubbed movies if I could, like I'd always watch subtitled. And recently I kind of came to peace with, you know, it's okay to just ignore <laughs> like <laughs> how the voice is coming through. Yeah. And just enjoy like the different elements that are coming there. So my last question, before we kind of wrap things up and I, Dan, this has been so much fun for me because I'm such a Kung Fu movie nerd. I love to, <laughs> to talk about this with somebody who's more of an expert than me. Um, and it's funny because I used to really think I knew everything about Kung Fu movies. And every time I hear like you and Quentin talking about it, I'm like, wow, I really don't know as much as I thought I did. And that's really impressive. Uh, I, I wouldn't even consider myself an expert. I mean, I think there's so much more, right? Like, I think it's constant student. That's what I consider myself, right? There's always more to learn. Yeah. But through this process, you had a chance to, um, and I know you mentioned the podcast that Riza came out to check out your collection. You've been you've been hanging out with with Quentin. You've been doing, you know, through this process, you've been able to meet all these other people that are, are archiving. What's the fun of that? Like, um, I think that's kind of like a fun kind of neat privilege that you get for all the hard work you put into to, to archiving this. So, well, what's great about that is most people, if I show them my film archive, they're usually just like, oh, all right, there's like some cardboard boxes with film and like some old film equipment. Like they think it's cool. Like, oh, this is, it's neat, right? Look at all this old yeah. film equipment and okay, there's film, but whatever, you know, the, but as far as like the titles, they're like, oh, what? You just have, do you have any, anything else? Do you have Raiders of the Lost Ark or whatever? But um, so like, I was so excited, like when Riza came and I was just like, oh my God, he's going to lose his mind when I show him the film archive. And I didn't even like give him a heads up. I was just like, I come check this out. And he was just like jaw hanging open. And when I was just going through the titles and it was just like, yep, these are the best. These are the best. You know what I mean? These are my favorites. And we're just talking about the movies. And then Tarantino, I had shown, I had met up with his assistant like six months before he came and given her a, a tour, showed her my collection. And then when he came to town and we hung out and then I texted her like, hey, thanks for setting everything up, whatever. And she just replied in all caps, did you show him your film archive? And I was like, yeah, he lost his goddamn mind. <laughs> <laughs> but again, it's because the titles, right? I mean, he he borrows stuff from me. So he knew what, he, what I had, but just being in the presence of them, right? It's like, so that's what it's fun more than like, oh, they're famous, but just they're people who are, are actually Kung Fu nerds and can really appreciate it. Yeah. Well, and, and for me, like um, I have two different relationships with, with um, like appreciating Quentin on that is one is I appreciate him as a writer and I would love to pick his brain about how he writes things, but it's really cool to see you guys pick each other's brain about Kung Fu movies because um that's when I go like, okay, wow. Like I thought I knew a lot and then, you know, and plus I, you know, I'm not going to lie. I was listening to your, to that podcast that you guys were talking and literally I had a notepad out and I'm writing down movies like the whole time. That's great. Good. You know? yeah. And the first two I watched was um, Beach of the War Gods and Soul Brothers of Kung Fu. Um, and it's funny because, you know, I think, um, it's important to share this because like we want to keep these movies alive and we want to keep like people following them and discovering these things so and and i just as a, as a fan as somebody who's been able to watch your prints 
Um, and I, it's one of the things I, when I list the things that I miss about Portland, Powell's is number one. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> Reading series is number two. <laughs> and well, the movie theaters in general, because we don't have like Laurel Hearst and, and Hollywoods and, and bad guys. Like I, I miss that so much about. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, and, and, um, and movie madness. And so I know I said last thing, but I just really quickly do want to give a shout out to movie madness. Um, during my time that I lived there, um, it was a like when we were looking for places to live, it was like, I have to be in quick bike riding distance to movie madness. Yeah. <laughs> like I not live in any other part of the city. It has to be Southeast because I have to be able to get there. And like, for me, like it was hilarious to have this experience when we moved to Portland. I already knew about Movie Madness before I lived there. It was like I had it on my list of like when we get there, you know, and and my second or third day in town, I get a membership in Movie Madness and I rented a Troy Hark's cannibal comedy, uh, We're Gonna Eat You, because that was a movie I had been searching for and been trying to see for 15 years at that point. Yeah. And just the idea that I could walk in in this movie that I've been trying to see for 15 years and well, there it is. And yeah. it wasn't as great as I had built it up to be, but so what? <laughs> I found it. I yeah. found it in Movie Madness. Did you get a chance to, when Quentin came to town, did he see Movie Madness? Did he get a chance to see that? No, that was one regret that I had that night because I was considering it. Um, you almost have to take them after the store is closed too. Like, well, that that was actually the plan because that was before the Hollywood Theater saved Movie Madness a couple of years ago. But that, he came to town before that happened. Mm -hmm. um, but it was, you know, he's he's such a celebrity that it's, I don't know how he can stand it. Like, just you know, he just gets swarmed, yeah, like constantly. I mean, even just being around that for a couple hours, it's like, oh my god. So I just tried to take him to like somewhere where nobody was going to be around <laughs> so we could actually just talk, you know, but I did, I was texting with Mike Clark, the owner of Movie Madness, and he was there and it didn't work out to bring him. It just, you know, just ran out of time, Yeah. but um, he'll come back and I'll take him to Movie Madness because he has to check it out. But yep. the, and the way that happened, my wife used to work at Movie Madness back in the nineties. Mm -hmm. Um, and so when Mike Clark was going to sell the store, he contacted us, my wife and I, just about like, hey, do you guys want to buy? He's like, I'm going to retire. I want the store to be saved. I don't want to sell off all the films, all the VHS and DVDs. Do you guys want to buy it? And so we talked it over, you know, a couple of days. And my wife was like, why not bring it under the Hollywoods nonprofit? So that was how that all wow. instigated. Yeah. That's so awesome. We did a Kickstarter and it was saved and you can still, you know, it's like 90,000 titles there. It's incredible. Yeah. And, and look, I just, for me, when I lived in Portland, even if I didn't know what I wanted to watch, or even if I didn't have time to watch a movie, just uh, browsing at uh, Movie Madness was a stress relieving activity for me. If I had a tough day, <laughs> I would just go and I used to take a notepad with me because I knew I couldn't rent everything that I found on a given day. <laughs> yeah. And I kept a running list of like, well, this, this, this is when I got to see, and you could just do a thing like, okay, today I'm going to look at Korean movies and I'm just, I'm just going to look at Korean movies or I'm just going to look at Westerns and I'm, I'm just going to stay in this area. And, um, and I think the ability to walk around and physically look at things it's like yeah imdb is great but you know to have it in your hands uh is is something incredibly special it really is and the digging that way is just you make more discoveries than what happens online you know when you're physically digging and you find and the way i really love the way movie madness is laid out and scarecrow in seattle is laid out in a similar fashion where, you know, if you are, if you're doing that thing of like, oh, the Korean movies, then you're like, who's this director that has a section? And I didn't even know who that was. And then you can pull the titles. It's just, it doesn't work the same way online. Like you discover stuff, sure. But it's just, it's not the same as when you're actually physically digging it seems to be more beneficial. Well, and, and it's just cool for me because like, 
for example, I, I remember like one of the first times I went to Movie Madness, I was, you know, I'm a huge Ringo Lamb fan as far as like Hong Kong movies. And it, and it, it, it just, the smile on my face the first time I was there when I saw that Ringo Lamb had a tag on the shelf <laughs> and that School on Fire and Prison on Fire and Prison on Fire 2 were there. And even though like when I lived in Indiana, I had to, I had to like, beg the cr crazy record store in town to like order these movies for me and you know it was before I discovered Yes Asia and all that and yeah you know all those things but it was like just walking in there and seeing that Ringo Lamb had his own shelf you know it was it, it was amazing it was a <laughs> cool thing so yeah. I appreciate that Dan um I've taken up a ton of your time and I, I but I, I had so much fun talking about this and and um, and talking about the movies is it, now you've done a couple podcasts or a couple, you have a couple projects that you're doing in quarantine. Can you tell the folks where they can find that stuff? Yeah. Um, well, if you want to hear that um, podcast with Tarantino, that's on the New Beverly's website, New Beverly Cinema. And have you read his reviews that he has up there too? Yeah, they're amazing. His yeah. film reviews on there too. So I'd say check that out. And then I've been doing. Uh, movie commentaries with Riza as well on 36 Cinema. Um, they're originally done live where we do it together and do a live movie commentary, but then they do have them have some of them archived on there as well. And so you can watch those. And I think those have been really fun. I was, when they first contacted me about it, you know, Riza's business partner contacted me. And I was like, all right. I was like, I don't know. I've never done a movie commentary before. And then you know, I just think Riza and I have a really good rapport. Like I was surprised we were, we did Shaolin versus Wu-Tang and we were about five minutes in and I was like, wow, this is working. Like, this is actually really fun, you know, and he's such an interesting guy. And, you know, I like the way he perceives the movies and he, he's again, he takes them seriously, but also he's having a good time with them. I think he writes that line really well. And so, and he just has interesting insights. He's such a philosopher. So yeah, there is cinema. Those have been on my list. I've been planning to watch them. I had a, um, um, I decided that of all the the panels that I'm doing in this series, that the Jet Li was the one that I had to dig back into the most because it's the one I don't know. I love Jet Li, but I don't know them quite as well as I know like a lot of the other stuff. Sure. So when I finished the Jet Li thing. That was like one of my next like kung fu dives is to do that. I may or may not have listened to your Pure Cinema. Quentin thing more than once. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty long. We talked for a long goddamn time. Yeah, it's over two hours, and and um, but it's great. And um, you know, I think it's it's cool because um, to get that kind of unvarnished Quentin talking about kung fu movies, and uh, you know, and there's definitely you know tons of titles I hadn't heard of before. Yeah. but he tells some interesting stories. He he told that story about being a little kid. And what he went to live with his grandparents in was it Tennessee? Yeah. And he said they weren't into movies. And he said he would walk to the drive-in, buy a ticket, and sit in the gravel and watch double features. I was like, I was like, has anybody even heard this story before? This is incredible. Like little yeah. Quentin Tarantino sitting in the gravel watching drive-ins. That's amazing. Well, well, and it was cool for me too because to hear his story about like reading the ads in the paper, not seeing the movie, and it's like that's the kind of thing that that's one of the reasons why I want to talk about both of our origin stories on that is because I think hearing how people got into these kung fu movies in different ways, and for me it was black belt theater, right? Yeah, but um, you know, it, it just it shows like you know the different entry points. It's just such an interesting thing for. Oh yeah, I'm I'm always constantly jealous and fascinated if i mean anybody who said they saw these movies in the theater like on 42nd street in new york like rizza has incredible stories about you know that was a dangerous environment like going to watch the movies that way he would skip school him and old dirty bastard and go watch like triple features all day long he told me sometimes it was two pornos and a kung fu movie so they had to sit through the pornos in like those disgusting theaters and wait to watch the kung fu movie that they wanted to watch like that's I, i'm always if i meet anybody who says they lived in new york and saw those movies on the big screen i always want to hear those stories i'm so jealous absolutely and it's funny because when you talk to the younger people like things that you don't think are a big deal like 
Um, I recently was talking to a big horror fan who like the fact that I went to see Hellraiser opening weekend with my father, which is hilarious. See, <laughs> That's great. Yeah. Um, in 1987, that, that, that was mind blowing to them. Like you got to see Hellraiser in the theater <laughs> and it's like, yeah. <laughs> and, and funny is, and I've told the story on the podcast before, but my father leaned over to me halfway through and said, somebody's taking you next time. <laughs> <laughs> It's great. But anyways, Dan, this was awesome. Um, uh, I love the Hollywood theater. I miss the Hollywood theater. So I know I've got a lot of friends in Portland that are listening. Um, old friends in Portland continue to support the Hollywood. And um, is Movie Madness operating during the quarantine? Like It is. Yeah, it's um, open three days a week. The hours are on the website. Um, and then there's also you can do express pickup where you pick your movies online and pick them up if you don't feel comfortable going in the store. So okay. Hollywood's closed right now, but we'll reopen, some, you know, in the spring or wherever, wherever we're allowed, but we will reopen, which is a good thing. I'm scared about how many movie theaters we're going to use or going to lose, but uh, well, Movie Madness is open. It shows that you guys are smart to become a nonprofit and take that route and, and be able to, to do that. And, and, uh, uh, it's an amazing, uh, beautiful old movie theater. I had tons of amazing memories from Lovecraft Fest and from all the different screenings. Um, and uh, my second favorite screening of Prince of Darkness as an adult, because I did get a chance to see Prince of Darkness at a screening inside the church where it was filmed. Whoa, LA. wow, that's great. And I never thought I was going to top seeing it at Lovecraft Fest. And then I got a chance to see it in the building where it was filmed. And that was mind blowing. Um, <laughs> but that's also another indication of like these physical, like the fact that they had an old print of it was great. They did not show it on DVD. It was great. Um, and it's just, it's a great thing that when we pres preserve these films and, and see them the way they were intended to be. Yeah, I agree. All right. Thank you, Dan. Yeah. Thanks for having me. This is really fun.